Uh, you lot, by the way, are friggin' awesome. Um, thank you so much. I asked you guys a question yesterday, looking for advice on sim racing hardware and software. My God, did you deliver so much information. Um, websites to visit, YouTube videos to watch, people to talk to, articles to read. Some of your comments were like absolute essays. And, you know, that's no frustration to me. That is massive help. So thank you. The detail that some of you went to and the lengths you went to, really appreciate it. Um, so I hope that in the end, eventually, the content that comes from all this will be some kind of, of just rewards for the effort that lots of you went to. So thank you very much for that. Uh, anyway, today we're going to look at something different. 2019. It is not very far away, is it? Just around the corner. And yet Formula One cars are going to be quite different to the ones that we're familiar with today. So how are they going to be different? Why are they going to be different? And what are the effects going to be of those different cars on track? Right, first of all, it's important to say that these, uh, these changes for 2019 were part of the original discussion for the big changes for 2021. Those discussions have been going on for a long, long time. If you think back to the Australian Grand Prix of last year, or sorry, this year, earlier this year, we had a, well, it's a pretty dull race, wasn't it? <laughs> Let's be honest. And it was the first race of the season and everybody was up in arms thinking, oh my goodness, it's gonna be a disastrous year. Look how boring the, the first race is gonna be. We can't sit here and go through another three seasons of this before we introduce these changes for 2020, 2021, 2020, 2021, 20, <laughs> 2021, that might make the difference at that point. So people started talking, Chase Carey and co started talking, Jean Todd got involved. Uh, they then got the teams involved, trying to work out if there was a way they could introduce some of those changes in a much more rapid fashion that might help improve the overtaking on track for 2019. So next season. Well, those discussion, discussions took place. Um, there were some really clear ideas from Nick Tombasis, the, uh, the head of the single-seater operation at the uh, FIA. A uh, very good technical guy. We, I worked with him at McLaren. He was also at Ferrari, also at Mano Motorsport as well. So he knows what he's talking about. He cherry-picked some of these details that we're going to see in 2019 uh, from the 2021 discussions and thought about the fact that they might be able to have a short-term, uh, quicker impact on the spectacle of Formula One racing. Now, lots of the teams, as they always do, fought back on this and said, look, can't work, it's not gonna work, too soon, let's just wait for 2021. And then something changed. Actually, it was at the very last minute, wasn't it? The day before, the deadlines had to be agreed upon to get them passed with a simple majority before, after that date, they would have then needed absolute consensus to be able to pass them. That absolute consensus never happens in Formula One when it comes to stuff like this. So it didn't look like they were gonna get these, these rule changes through. And at the very last minute, some of the bigger teams strangely changed their stance and decided to back the changes, got the majority across the line together with the FIA, FOM, and all of the other major stakeholders to get a vote in these kind of things. And the changes were introduced, even though at that stage, they were just conceptual changes. There was no regulation as such. It was just about ideas. Then the discussions had to come along about what exactly those ideas might look like, how the regulations might be formed to actually get that on paper so that the teams could really detail down and work on exactly what they needed to, to look into with regards to their 2019 cars. Now, don't forget, this was back in April of this year when the 2019 car designs were already well underway at every team up and down the pit lane. So first of all, why did the big teams change their mind? Well, nobody quite knows really at this point, but it's highly likely, in my opinion, that uh, the FIA and FOM offered the bigger teams, the Mercedes and the Ferraris of this world, perhaps some concessions in the bigger 2021 picture around uh, engine or power unit regulations. Um, perhaps allowed them a little bit more say in shaping the power unit regulations for the 2021 uh, uh, changes than they might have otherwise had. Don't forget the FO, uh, FOM really wanted to drastically change 2021 and, and change the engine or the power unit um, for that period but actually what we've ended up with is something much much closer to what we got now for 2021 when it comes to power units and that was very much dictated or pushed for by the bigger teams. So maybe there was a link there, maybe they were offered something in one hand 
to capitulate a little bit on these 2019 reg changes. We don't know, just a, just a theory of mine. Anyway, let's have a look. It's happening now, there's no discussion over it. It is happening. We will see different looking cars in 2019, hopefully with an effect of improving overtaking on track. That's what they were all designed for, to try and improve the overtaking ability, the following closely to another car, and then the overtaking ability uh, whilst uh, during Grand Prix. So, what we've got essentially a big changes to the front wing, changes to the rear wing, changes to the barge boards and brake duct areas of the car. Those are the headlines. There are a couple of other things that will change too, but in very, very basic terms, the front wing will become wider. It actually becomes as wide as the car itself, two meters wide, up from 1800 millimeters to 2000 millimeters in its overall width. Now the last time we had front wings as wide as the overall cars, I think was 2009, and that didn't last very long because we kept getting punctures and uh, end plates being knocked off of cars in, in the close quarter racing, particularly at the beginning of races. Punches happening all over the shape because those very sharp uh, front wing end plates that were all the way out as, as wide as the tyres themselves were being bumped in the, uh, in the hustle and bustle of the first few corners and resulting in, in punches and damage to cars that meant they had to come into the pit. So it was actually narrowed after that. We've now gone back to the full width. Now, It'll be interesting to see what effect that has. Is it going to have exactly the same effect where we're going to see cars running into each other and suffering potentially race ending or certainly race limiting damage? We shall see. So front wings much, much wider, but key to all of this is that they are actually much, much simpler. The front wings of today look incredibly complex, don't they? They're a minefield when you look at them, almost works of art with uh, flaps all over the place. Now, in 2019, you're going to see a very, a very wide front wing with a maximum of five elements, five different elements on either side. We've now got these boxes on either side that the teams are allowed to design within. That box has become wider, as I say, it's also become slightly taller. Um, but we are no longer allowed to have all of the flaps and flick ups that we've had and that we've become used to. Now, much of those um, upper flaps and cascade elements that are on top of those front wing planes were all designed to direct airflow up over the front tyre and out around the front tyre. The front wing end plates, ridiculously complex things of today's Formula 1, designed all to do with directing massive vortices, spinning vortices of air off those front wing end plates in a real aggressive shape around the front tyres of the car to draw away that turbulent front tyre wake that's so disruptive for the airflow over the rest of the car. The effect of that though is that we get an aerodynamic shape. If you were to look down on a Formula One car in a wind tunnel from above, you've got the car maybe this wide, but the actual aerodynamic shape, because of the spinning vortices that are cascading outwards, ends up being more like this wide. So you've got a huge aerodynamic shape traveling along a straight because of the, the actual width of the aerodynamic forces and spinning vortices that are coming off that. So, 2019 is all designed around bringing that back in, bringing that narrower, because those are the things that have one of the biggest impacts on the cars behind, when they get into that space, lose so much of their aerodynamic downforce, because their own front wings are so detailed and so reliant on all of the different surfaces to generate downforce and to control the airflow over the rest of their own car. So, simpler front wings, no flips and flaps, uh, fewer elements, uh, fewer strakes underneath the front wing main planes, that narrows down to two now. Uh, and the angles of those are very much determined in the regulations. The end plates themselves are so prescribed in the regulations now that they are almost a standard spec part. Um, there is very little freedom for the designers in the front wings of 2019 compared to anything that I can think back of over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and that's going to be frustrating on one hand for the engineers and the designers at Formula One teams, but on the other still offers some opportunity, even if it may be a much smaller opportunity. Still the guys who do a better job with this will have an advantage. It's bordering now on the point of, particularly around the end plate, having a spec end plate that every team can use. Almost to the point of asking the question, well why don't we just do that? <laughs> if we're going to go in this direction, why don't we do that? It can save a huge amount of money for everybody. 
Um, and perhaps that's how it'll end up in the future at some point. We'll wait and see. Uh, right, so front wings, simpler, wider. So the fact they're wider gives us more span, allows us to generate more downforce from that front wing. But it's important to say the front wings of Formula One cars are not just about generating downforce. In, that, in fact, that's actually not the most important part of what a front wing does. In current Formula One, the front wing actually is much more about controlling and managing airflow across the rest of the car, directing uh, vortices and, and channels of airflow to other parts of the car where it needs it most or where it doesn't need it, like dragging that front tyre wake away from the car, up over the front tyre, uh, channeling airflow through the centre of the car to the underbody, around the side pods and to the rear wing and diffuser. Those are key elements of what the front wing does. And those are things that are now going to be much harder to achieve with the much more simplified front wing elements that we have. Um, so more downforce, less control at the front wing. Front brake ducts are going to be much simpler as well. Shrunk down, less uh, scope to put aerodynamic devices on them, winglets and um, turning vanes that we see at the moment. That's all going. Blown front axles, going. Uh, again, because the blown front axle where you channel airflow through the front brake ducts, divert some of that airflow to cool the brakes and divert some of it to go through the front axle, again, is dragging the energised airflow out through the centre of the wheel and outboard of the car itself. Again, increasing the overall virtual span, if you like, of the aerodynamic shape that the car is affecting as it drives down a straight. So that goes. Um, the barge boards are going to be much simpler, they're going to be much lower than we see right now. And actually a big part of that regulation change uh, was, um, was derived because of the need to keep space, uninterrupted space, for sponsors, for logos, for branding, uh, for marketing. I know it might sound uh, ridiculous, but it's an important part of Formula One. Uh, the barge boards move forward as well by I think 100 millimetres. So Everything comes down and slightly forward and becomes much, much simpler in that area. That all means that the engineers and the designers have a much harder job to control the airflow and generate downforce with much less available bodywork and available scope for design in order to do that. Uh, the rear wing becomes bigger, it becomes wider, it becomes deeper, it becomes longer. Um, the end plates become simpler, we lose all of the little louvers the horizontal louvers along each end plate. And actually a big part of that is also to do with branding and marketing, to give an uninterrupted space for sponsors' logos too. Um, but also that will have the effect of uh, reducing, or oh, sorry, increasing drag. Uh, you're going to get much stronger vortices coming off the rear wing, wing tips, something that those horizontal louvers were all designed to minimise. Minimising drag, allowing the car to go faster. So the rear wing with its bigger scope and bigger size will generate more downforce. The DRS flap equally is bigger, opens up another 20 millimetres. That means the DRS, DRS effect is going to be greater. So if you do manage to get closer to a car in front, you flip your DRS open on the straight, the power of that DRS is going to be greater. You're going to dump more drag than you're able to jump, dump this year. And that means you should easily be able to get a slingshot past the car in front. One unanswered question at this stage is that going to be too effective? Is the power of that DRS going to be too great? Are we going to see uh, you know, cars being lapped and then that lapped car picking up a DRS effect down a straight and actually being able to re-overtake the car in front? Or are we going to see cars that really shouldn't be getting involved in fights? A topical subject. Um, getting involved with the leaders because their cars are so much quicker because of the DRS effect. Um, are overtakes going to be just too easy? on some of those circuits that we see. Some circuits, we all agree, I think, don't need DRS, and yet we're going to have it with a much more powerful effect. The FIA say it's going to be around about a second to a second and a half slower in 2019, certainly at the beginning of the year, to the way it is now. And that's all because of the increased drag, but also the, the um, diminished ability to control that airflow across the car in the, in the efficient manner that we have it now. Um, so the teams have got a, a tough job on their hand to recover some of that. No doubt by the end of next season they will, and maybe they'll even be going faster than we are right now. They have a very, very uh, impressive ability to overcome these restrictive regulations whenever they apply. Uh, is it going to be a good thing or not? 
I just don't know, and I don't think anybody knows. The research from the FIA all say that actually overtaking will be improved, or the ability to overtake will be improved, and if that's the case, then great. The ability to follow cars more closely should be improved. Great, that's what we all love to see. Um, as with any of these things though, there's always a, an unpredicted effect. Uh, and that, I guess, is what we'll have to wait and see. Interesting, the teams have been very much involved in shaping these regulations. The teams were given special dispensation to have extra uh, CFD allowance over and above what the current regulations prescribe. So I think they got something like an extra two weeks of CFD usage back when these were, were being initially talked about to contribute some research and some data to the discussion around the, the actual regulations. And it's a really good sign of, of the teams working together, the teams working with the FIA and with the FOM. So that's a positive, um, but we'll have to wait and see what the actual results on the racetrack bring. Uh, and at the moment, I guess just nobody knows.